to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. Sarah Malik Barney, the founder and principal designer of Band Interiors in Austin, Texas, joins us on the show today. Sarah comes to the design world from an executive level career in entertainment and sports industries. Married with children and itching to explore a new career outside of entertainment and sports, Sarah earned her interior design degree while working full time. In 2017, Sarah made the big decision to quit her job and launch Band. Now, just three and a half years in business, Band has managed more than 120 projects with what is actually a growing team of seven. And people are noticing Sarah's success. Sarah has been named one of Fortune Magazine's Most Powerful Women and was featured in Austin Monthly's Women to Watch. Before we get into this conversation with Sarah, let's take a moment and thank Kirsch for sponsoring the show. I've been talking to you about Kirsch for several months, and I wonder if you've gone yet to Kirsch.com to see all of the drapery hardware options that they have for your window treatment projects. I think it's worth 20 minutes of your time to click around a few pages and see the various styles and options. This is the being prepared that we always talk about. When you know what you have at your disposal, what you have in your designer toolkit, when you are on site, you will be prepared to say, oh, I know the perfect rod collection to coordinate with the lighting that we're selecting, right? So do yourself a favor and go to Kirsch.com and learn about everything from the sleek architect to the decorative rods like the Buckingham collection. All righty. Now, I'm a little ahead of you because Sarah was with me in one of my masterminds in 2020, but I am looking forward to introducing her to you. Hi, Sarah. Thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hi, Luann. Thanks for having me. Yes, Sarah. I'm looking forward to having this conversation with you. Of course, we know each other from that emergency mastermind that we put together. (laughs) (laughs) This seems like a decade ago. Right? I mean, honestly, we put emergency mastermind together at the request of our now good friend, Susan Winterstein, right? Yes. And she said, I need people that are in the same business level that I am. I need to go know how to handle COVID. Yes, yes. <laughs> right? And all in a panic. Exactly. Yes. And the six or seven of us got together every single week for seven or eight weeks to get through. And I've said it before on the show, but Sarah... Every one of us had the exact same experience. We were scared to death. Oh my goodness, are we going to lose our business? And by the end of the eight weeks, we were all going, oh my goodness, I have so much business. Now I don't know how to handle it, right? Yeah, basically. I mean, it was a quick turnaround for sure. (laughs) You know, it really was. And I know that, I know for me, maybe you'll share for you. I know that it almost seemed... I don't want to say the words too easy because there's nothing easy in running our business, but it, it really started out with, okay, what do we do? We group, are we, do we need to let employees go? How, what are we doing with our marketing? And by the third week, it was like, I'm getting a little busy. And by the fifth week, it was like, I've got six and people remember our quick win. I've got eight projects that I've got to call back potential clients. on, <laughs> And then it just, um, it became a new problem, which was a better problem, but also a problem. Um, and I know that I reflected a lot on that. And I don't think it was a coincidence. I do think it was the collective ideas every week, just the combination of hearing the different ways that each of the other designers in the group were marketing and just knowing that there were other people experiencing the same thing seem to be one of the positives, I think, in turning things around. What do you think, Sarah? 
I totally agree. And we kind of came at it, or at least my firm did from a slightly different perspective. I don't know if you'll remember this, but we were overbooked for 2020 when COVID hit. And I was panicking, how are we going to do this without hiring a ton more people? And it, to me, it was almost like a blessing because we got time to slow down a little bit <laughs> um, and catch up and, you know, get our bearings straight, right. which if we hadn't been in that position, we would have been like, okay, what do we do? Where do we find projects? But um, we were kind of in a good spot there in that regard, but it did allow us a little breathing room, thankfully. Yes. Yeah. And to your point, I remember when Susan reached out, she said, until this exact moment, we were headed for a record breaking year and I don't want this to fall apart. So it's to your same point. You were overbooked, had a lot of projects and it was the first meeting was making sure. And then we did all experience not being able to move projects forward because we'd had employees that couldn't come to work and vendors that were closed. And so it was a roller coaster ride, but Yes. I found it extremely helpful and valuable to be on the ride with you ladies. <laughs> yes. And who knew? We didn't know then what we know now is that nothing would be in stock later. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. So anyway, so I'm grateful for that opportunity to spend those weeks with you. And now we're going to get a chance to pull apart your business. Um, we described it in the intro that in under four years, you have over 120 projects under your belt, Sarah. And and you've grown your team from yourself as, you know, doing it as a side hustle while you have a family, while you were had a full time job and while you were in design school building this business. And I'd like you to just take me back and think about what what was the, how did you. So many designers, they they have their business, they get started, they've overcome the hurdle of should I do a business, right? Let's just pass that hurdle because we know that's one hurdle. Should I do it? Can I do it? But assume we get past that hurdle. Now you make that decision. You know, putting those projects in the pipeline, it's one thing to, and and not to be underestimated, um, to have projects while you're side hustling. But once you make that commitment and you left that full-time job, now we need projects in the pipeline. That's different than, oh, awesome, another project. How did you jumpstart your business, Sarah? So it was a number of things. Um, my background is in business, specifically in the entertainment industry. And so I did have a little bit of a leg to stand on there. I kind of knew, and also more specifically, it was in sales. So I kind of knew mm. how to bring in those clients and how to chase leads a little bit. I had a little bit of a, a head start there. But I knew that the biggest thing, I kind of put myself in a client. Um, shoes or a prospective client shoes. How would I find a designer? How would I, if I was looking to hire a designer, what, what are the things I'd be looking for? Um, and there were a few things. One, I needed to be able to find them. So if I Googled interior designer or interior designer, Austin, what came up? Um, because as it was starting out, I was not findable um, because I was a brand new baby business. And also, you know, where was I finding inspiration? Well, it was through social media and Instagram. So the two places I really started um, for putting myself out there and trying to find those leads and sort of make our presence known was through um, an, an investment and in SEO which is search engine optimization. And so that people could find us through Google, people could find us through house. And then also through social media, I knew as one person, I couldn't handle doing more than one social media platform. And I knew I needed to really invest in one specific platform to really make it grow. Um, and I chose Instagram just because it was the most visual while still being the most um, interactive with one another. And so I spent a lot of time trying all different things, both on Instagram, through SEO and um, just really making our digital footprint known. Cause that to me as one person was going to be the easiest way to cast the widest net um, for that awareness for when, when prospective clients came knocking, it was because they found us um, through one of these platforms. I love it. I love it. So two things you invest in SEO, you know that you need to be found on Google instead of hoping that they find you. And I love the secondary decision to say, you know what, instead of doing Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, everything under the sun, while I have a family, while I have this business, I'm going to be strong in one area. 
So great, great thought process. So tell me about that SEO investment. So what did that look like? And, you know, there's many people listening saying, all right, well, how do you invest in SEO? What does that mean for you, Sarah? Yeah, what's the funniest thing I say about SEO is that people ask, how did I find the firm that we work with? And I said, I Googled it and they were the first results. So that meant that they had good SEO. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, um, I started working with a firm that specialized in architects and designers. And so they really had a strong um, knowledge of oh, definitely on Google, but then also um, house, which was important in my marketplace at least. And so um, we, we spent a lot of time with them telling them what was important about the business. What did I, what kind of client did I want to attract? Um, what, what are the keywords that were important in my specific area? And so we spent a lot of time doing that. And the thing about SEO in particular that I think a lot of people get scared of or nervous about is that, you know, yes, you have to invest, but it also, it takes a while to see results. So you're not going to invest. And then a month later be like, wow, look at that. I'm like being blown up here with Google leads. No, it was, you know, it takes six months to a year for your digital footprint to really change. So spending a lot of time kind of waiting on that and, um, fine tuning that and taking their suggestions. Um, I didn't take all of them. At one point they asked me to change the name of my firm. And I said, no, that's mm. ridiculous. Um, they said, well, you'll be more findable. And I said, I don't care. I'm not changing the name of my <laughs> firm. So, uh, so, you know, there was a lot of like back and forth in that regard. And, the, and even now when we still work with them and what's so great is whenever you know, we have a new project, they take the wheel after we've got the photography back, we give them the information about the project and the pho the photography and they run with it, um, promoting it kind of across all channels. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So in there, I love that you had an eyes wide open understanding that it was a minimum of six months and possibly a year until you could really look at an SEO company and say, guys, it's happening or it's not happening. Right. So you right. didn't have expect it to be a magic wand. And when you described, Sarah, that you spent a lot of time with them in the beginning, helping them understand who you are, who you service, what the SEO words are that you should be found for, what does that mean in, in real time? Is that you had a weekly meeting, a biweekly meeting, a monthly meeting? Tell us about that, because I think we, we need to understand what goes into creating that. Yeah, it, it honestly was more of this really, really comprehensive questionnaire that they sent to me when we first started working together. We did a few calls in the beginning back and forth. And now we're in such a management mode where it's, you know, it's almost like autopilot. We'll check in with them from time to time or we'll do like a, an annual audit of, of kind of where we're at. Um, but it was really at the very beginning. And it was a lot about... Um, you know, when you're talking about like the keywords and those sorts of things, it was like, what neighborhoods do you want to target in your marketplace? It's mm. not just like Austin. It's like, no, no, no. Where are the areas I want to be doing projects? I don't want to be doing, I mean, I'll do projects all over Austin, but I don't necessarily want to be driving all over the city. Mm. Where are those five key areas? And it comes, and the reason it's important and you start to learn is it's, it's those key words that people are searching for. And that's why if you see things now, that reference our firm, it always includes my name and that my name was never part of the firm, but they, they, um, infused my name into all of these different, um, links and things that they post because when pe if people search for me, it needs to also come up with our firm. So it, it, there's a lot of those like tweaks that you have to make. And sort of one of the reasons I hired SEO from the beginning is it, it's almost like a video game. It's so hard to crack and it's so hard to know all the tiny little minutia. And I, again, am but one person, so I couldn't try to learn SEO and figure it out on my own. So that's, was one of the basis for hiring a professional. And I'm very big on hiring out. It, it's for something that somebody's better at than you are. I don't claim to be an expert in all things. I can be an expert in a few things. So that was a big piece of it. 
I love that. You know, it's, you know, so many designers understand that, you know, a, a, a particular consumer with great taste could probably put together a decent room, but you as a professional are going to see the gaps and the obstacles and the, the places that the, the person with good taste is going to miss, whether it's scale, proportion, whatever it is, right? And so right. it's the same thing. You could guess about SEO or you could hire somebody. And so awesome. And tell me when you talk about the investment um, that you made in it in the beginning. So you did this from year one. Do you recall what that investment in dollars was, Sarah, in year one? Yeah, uh, I, I can definitely say it. I will say, you know, if you reach out to this company today, their fr their prices have changed. So don't hold me to these numbers. <laughs> um, but when I first started and they, I believe they still structure it this way. They have like sort of like tiers of packages and, and it's like, how involved do you need them to be? How involved do you want them to be? Do you want them to write your blog for you too? And there's a lot of services they can provide. And I ended up going with the, just the basic starter package, which was right around $1,000 a month. Um, and the way I saw it was sort of if I, and I'm tracking all my leads and where they're coming from. And if, if I'm getting leads from Google and house regularly, I know that part of that's from our work, but then, and just general searching, but also part of that's from them. So I could, I could put a dollar amount to whether or not this service was at least paying for itself, if not providing more income to us. Um, and I've always stayed at that basic package. We've talked about increasing it before. Um, but then we kind of look at what it increasing it means and it doesn't necessarily I don't think it's going to provide much more value uh, on top of what we're already getting from it. Mm. Well, and also to your point, you've got a four year now base of them right. doing this SEO for you. So it yeah. has, you know, that that is the investment that keeps paying dividends, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The more, the more you're it, it the, the big thing it tracks is backlinks and um, just that overall searchability. And the more of those that you create, the more it starts, that's what I'm talking about this autopilot, the more it starts to run itself and the, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and harder to sort of quietly make it go away. Mm. And and regardless of what their fees may be now for that entry level package, the reality is that, you know, we always have to color everything with inflation and all the things. So four years ago, a thousand dollars was a big investment. It's still a big investment. Let's not be yeah. let's not kid ourselves. But if it's fifteen hundred or eighteen hundred now, it's four years later, right? It's like a house is cost more money, all the things. So the point in that though is that here you are a new business and you had been doing projects as a side hustle, but were you at a position at that point, Sarah, where you had earned enough money and you're like, okay, if I'm going to commit to this $1,000 a month, that's $12,000, i have already earned that, I have that in the bank? Or did you have to, you know, have a, a moment with yourself and you say, I'm going to have to put money into this? And how did that work for you? Well, I saw it as, well, one, an investment in myself and the business. And when I first started the firm, you're right, I was working full time. I would do it at night. I was going to design school. And I kind of thought this isn't going to be a real thing. This is going to be like a hobby on the side. Mm. Um, and then it kept, people kept coming and people kept knocking. And that wasn't, that. this was all before the SEO. And I was like, oh my goodness, like this is a real job. And I got to the point where I was burning the candle at both ends. Um, but like you said, I am um, a mom and I have a mortgage and I've got um, bills to pay and a husband and all those things. I'm going to like, I'm a grown up. I'm not <laughs> fresh out of school. And so I knew I couldn't go back and just start as an intern. And um, so I said to my husband, well, I was like, listen, I can't keep doing this. I'm working literally nonstop and I love work and I don't mind working a lot, but I, I'm going to burn out. And he's, we had a conversation and we kind of looked at our finances and, and said, here's including SEO and all the other things, the operating costs of a business for this baby business starting out, all things considered, okay, if we invest this, meaning you aren't going to take a salary from your current full-time job for a year, we could give this a run. And mm -hmm. if it doesn't work out after a year, no love lost, you can go find a job. You're only a year out of the workforce. You've had a successful career so far. Let's just give it a shot. And I mean, that was in, I want to say like July of 2017. And uh, by September, I was hiring my first employee. Wow. 
Okay. But see, I love that conversation there because it's not just the investment for, I love that you mentioned the operating expenses in addition to the SEO expenses, but you also had to account for not bringing your salary in the front, in the front door of the house too. (laughs) So this is really putting it on the line. This is saying, okay, but you do have a conversation with your, your, you know, yourself and your husband and you say, let's give it a shot. And It reminds me of the episode with Jenny Madden. I don't know if you remember that episode, Sarah, but Jenny Madden had her business here. She's here in New Jersey and um, it was growing and it was time for her to have an operations manager. And I don't recall from the episode if that's what they call her husband, Greg, but it was time to have that person that really oversaw the finances, the business, so that Jenny could be the one to still execute the projects and be on boots on the ground with the clients. And of course, she had an assistant in different things. And you know, he had a great job in New York City, uh, I, I think in the banking industry. And you just don't take that job out of the household and not have a plan. And their plan was three months because, of course, I'm sure, um, you know, whatever their mixture of criteria was. And it was, we can do this for three months. If in three months, having you on board doesn't create more income because it frees me up to be the rainmaker, right? Then we have to re we have to just look at each other and say, we gave it a shot. So the idea is, is that it's a personal, it's a personal analyzation between if it's just you and your own income and your own uh, cost of living, or it's a part of a family. It's that thinking ahead is how you, to me, you light the fire and you say, okay, we just, I just left my job. I've got to do this. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, And it it, it was an, it was a necessary conversation. And again, it was like sort of believing in myself and my husband believing in me, but you know, separate from uh, Jenny's situation, my husband still had his job. Yes. So even though I wasn't bringing in an income and I was, you know, frankly, the breadwinner, even though I wasn't the one uh, bringing in those, that money anymore, I guess we kind of felt like if it's only a year, big deal, you know, mm-hmm. like, yeah, it might suck for that year, but at least we can say we tried and, right. you know, it didn't work out and no big deal. Right. And I, you know, I was barking up the wrong tree. Yeah. No, I I love it. And it also, you know, I remember, I don't remember the details of it um, at this point so many years out, but Cheryl Luckett also explained in her second interview on the show, I believe, or maybe it was their first interview on the show, she explained her plan for her financial plan for moving the her design firm from a side hustle to a full-time business. And so, you know, again, it is just, I'm just driving home the point that we don't just quit our job willy nilly and say, I hope it works. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Right. We have a plan. And I love that. And I love the end line on the plan because I imagine if you had gotten to the year mark, if it wasn't producing an income for yourself and your family, it probably would have been hard to give up on it. But I, you know, knowing that your background is in business, you know, it occurs to me that you probably really would have looked in the mirror and said, OK, this is not happening. Yeah, I would have been uh, annoyed to not be making money for sure. Yeah, I yes. would, I yeah, I'd be like, okay, that was fun. That was a fun little like art project we did. Right. But um, but no, yeah, I definitely it, the money was a, a, a driving force of it for mm-hmm, sure. Mm-hmm. And I and, and it's funny because while I'm saying as I know that you have enough business acumen that you would have cut it off if it wasn't successful. I also know it's your business acumen that was going to do make it show that it was successful. <laughs> Let's be serious, right? I mean, yeah. That's- <laughs> That's true. And I didn't, there was a lot I didn't know. And obviously still don't know about running a design business because there's always things you can learn, but it was at now knowing what I know and seeing some people's sort of like, I'm starting out from it the first time and I've never worked in business and I see their struggles and kind of the things they go through. And I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm happy that I kind of at least had that foundation to start off on and I could trust in that and be confident in that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And for a designer listening that doesn't have the business background, you know, what, what what is your advice and your suggestion? Of course, so many are listening to the podcast, understanding things and different um, gaps in their knowledge and what they do uh, there. You could go to business school. 
you could work for other, you could work for a firm like yourself that is well run. What it, what would you say to somebody listening that's like, great, Sarah, but I didn't have 10 years in the business world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. You didn't go back to doing that. Um, no, I mean, so here's what I do recommend. And I see this from employees in my own firm who got their bachelor's, like right out of college, 22 years old, got their bachelor's in interior design, which I laugh at because at 18, I didn't even know you could own a home, let alone design one. So I definitely would never have immediately picked that um, as an 18 year old going to college. Mm -hmm. well, the th but the thing I see from them and that they complain to me about is that interior design programs as a whole don't set you up for business. They don't make you take business classes. They assume you're going to work commercial design and you're going to go work for some giant firm and you're just going to figure it out along the way. Um, and every, and I, so what my recommendation would be is take some business classes, even if they're online, even if it's a YouTube video, read about business in general, not as it relates to design, kind of remove the design from it. And then you can tailor it and tweak it to fit the design mold, but learn about just design as a whole, um, and kind of the basics of, starting your own business, running your own business. What is it like to work with a client? Like that's a big one that I think gets lost a lot that, you know, I've got, I've had designers that have worked for me that are like, oh, I hate working with clients. And it's like, well, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, because my background is in sales. I am well averse to dealing with somebody who's upset, somebody who is, you know, can't make a decision or needs a little bit of extra help or is maybe a wacky personality. So I'm able to sort of mold into those conversations really easily because I've done that. So it's like, it honestly too takes some psychology classes because mm. there's a lot of psychology that goes into what it is that we do with clients. So I think it's really kind of that um, continuing education a little bit that's don't think about design specific education that you might want. Think about business and psychology and just the way that people behave in general and study that because I think that'll help you go a long way. I love it. I love it. Great, great advice. So good. And then of course too, I, I, I mean, do, how do you feel you didn't happen to work or did you, did you spend any time working for other firms, Sarah, or you just started doing your side hustle while you were in school and full-time and raising children, <laughs> you know, I, two o'clock in the morning. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, I have never worked for another firm. Okay. Okay. So, but outside of having a, a business degree and 10 years in a business industry, um, in industry, I should say, uh, would you also say in addition to, to continuing education in business courses outside of design courses, that's also a great place to, like the people that are working for you now are getting great education in if one day they want to own their own business because they're learning how a, well, a business is well run. Do you agree? Totally agree. Mm -hmm. And it actually even designers that we have that come from other firms, they're like, whoa, this is different. This is just different. Um, but I, I like that it's different because it doesn't have to be the way it's always been done. You know, it, you kind of have to do what works for you. Right, right. I just know that in the interviews that I've had, over the last five years and the designers that I know in our life in connect in connection with window works that there there's either one, there seems to be almost two a one an either or factor, either you spent a good several years, whether you need three or 10, um, working for someone else and really doing the whole list of what works well in this firm and what doesn't work well in this firm and or coming from a actual prior business background, right? And yeah. it's one or the other that informs. It doesn't mean that you can't come out of school or just change a career and um, come out of, you know, whatever and start a firm and be successful, but there's a leg up there. Yeah. And I mean, listen, at the end of the day, design is subjective and you either have an eye for it or you don't. Whether or not you got your bachelor's in it at 22 years old or you're 50 years old and thinking about going into it, it you either you either can do it or you can't. So everything else is sort of extra to make yourself stronger as a business. Um, the design part will just come naturally. Right, right, right. And, and, and especially, you know, 
it, it's what you're passionate about. So that's right. easy to sit around on the nights and the weekends and read up on and investigate, right? It's it's making yourself right. read up on the things that aren't so fun, like, you know, online bookkeeping and all those things. <laughs> uh, yes. I don't look at spreadsheets anymore. I refuse. But I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's absolutely true. And it's, it's not always fun, but why is it always going to be fun? Name one job where it's always, always fun. And there's like never anything bad. And I would love to say that I spend 90% of my time designing but it's actually the inverse. I spend 90% of my time running my business and 10% designing. So it's just, that's part of it. Uh, Luckily, I love business as a whole and I love sort of studying that, but but you kind of have to know that going into it. It's not going to always be, you know, fabrics and furniture. No, it's the truth. And, you know, it just reminds me of Desi Cresswell, you know, when she was on the show and we were talking about how, you know, her, her, she's a life business coach for interior designers and she's one of the co-authors in the book and she helps designers, you know, get, be productive and be the CEO, have the CEO mindset in her business, in your business. And we were talking on the episode one time, about, well, you know, when you have to do something you don't want to do, you don't really enjoy doing it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm pushing her back and, you know, going back and forth. And finally, she just said to me, and I have to repeat the line all the time on the show, because I think it's such a great one. She said, well, Luann, to that, ultimately, I would just say to you what I say to my kids, you're not always going to feel like doing what you have to do. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Get over it. I mean, we're all adults here. Like, yeah, it's, it's, sometimes it's going to suck. And sometimes you're not going to like it, but you have to do what you have to do. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So tell me a little bit about these, you know, more than 120 projects in uh, f- four short years. One of the things I would love to know is because in the beginning of our business, I think every one of us has experienced that I'm going to take every job no matter what, because I have a thousand dollar bill due to the SEO guy and I don't have a paycheck coming in and all the reasons each of us has when we get our business off the ground. So tell me about the makeup of your 120 plus jobs. Are you in, I'm assuming that it, it, you definitely always had the combination of the small jobs, the medium jobs, and, and it probably led to the bigger jobs. Do you maintain a mix, Sarah, now, or have you niched yourself into, I only do this type of work? What, what does your composition of those 120 jobs look like? Yeah, so I uh, would love to say that these 120 projects were all brand new, full home, ground up construction. <laughs> but that would be insane if I had accomplished that much in four years. Um, we definitely have a, a mix. And I don't like to say, I, well, the people in the office probably hate me for saying this. I don't like to say no to everything. Um, and I don't take a hard line in the sand about it. What we sort of base it on is, do these seem like people we want to work with? Just, you know, like generally do we like them or are they going to be great clients to us? Um, But also what does their project entail? And does it make sense? You know, we get calls all the time, like, can you help me pick out paint and hardwood flooring? It's like, yeah, no, like that's not going to give me sort of the end result that is going to be worth it to you. Um, So I try to look at it more as like, how much value can we add to this project, regardless of the size of it? If it's something where like, help me pick some paint colors, it's like, that's not going to do much for you. And you're going to think you kind of wasted your money with us. So uh, it's more like the deliverables and can we make something really fun and great out of this? So yeah, our projects are all over in size. Um, Definitely the smaller ones have become harder for us to say yes to just from a sheer bandwidth issue. But, um, but we definitely, we keep it open and I don't like to come at it from like a really hard line saying, no, we will only take X budget or certain size. Okay. Do you see that as, there's two ways to ask, do you see that as sustainable Or, and do you see it as desirable? In other words, do you have a desire to get to a point where you're like, if you're not doing a full house or a full floor, I'm not the girl for you? Or do you prefer, and and do you see in the future, and by the way, there's no crystal ball and you could change your mind in two years, right? But (laughs) right now, do you see that as the sustainable model for you, that you you will take it on a project by project basis uh, according to your criteria, and it could be small or large, or do you see the trajectory eventually going to a certain way because you desire it to go a certain way? 
I do think from a bandwidth issue, eventually we are going to have to be in a position where we're saying no to those smaller projects. Um, what's been hard in the past is kind of like you're talking about, you know, I have an SEO bill to pay. For me, saying no is like income loss, regardless of what the size of the project is. Um, but I also know that sometimes smaller projects can take up just as much time as larger projects can. So um, I, I don't want to be doing those tiny little one-offs from time to time. But I, like I said, I kind of also, what if something really cool and great comes along? And here I am, I've made this delineation that no, I won't do this. And I've met, I've been referred a lot of great clients who are like another designer sent me over to you because they only do full homes and I really need help with just these three rooms. And they ended up being great projects and great clients. So, um, and on that same note, we've done a room for a client and then they ended up selling their house, buying a new house and now wants to do the full home. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I I do prefer to do, you know, the larger projects and the bigger thing, but I, I don't necessarily think that that's something I want as, as an only in the future. Okay. And I hear that. It's funny because I think there's a nuance in there, right? When you just said, sometimes when you take the smaller project, it turns into when they move or build into the bigger. It's for us at Window Works, you know, somebody will say to me, will you come out for one window? And yeah. it isn't a hard always yes or a hard always no. So am I going to come in, go into New York City for one window? You know, bridges, tolls, easy pass, <laughs> parking, you know, hour you know, to hour and a half to go 13 miles, you know, each way. Yeah. Right. And and for a three hundred dollar blind, that's cost wise. That is ridiculous to even contemplate, right? But right. you can't just say no on its face value. There has to be, well, who is it calling? Oh, is it my client that I just did $25,000 worth of window treatments in her home here in New Jersey? Well, you don't leave that client hanging. You don't ask them. You don't invite them to find another resource, right? right, like, right. Exactly. Like, let's be practical, right? Um, yeah. And so I hear that it's in the beginning, I think, in a business uh, for designers, there's what I've learned in conversation with rising designers starting out is there is a message of don't say yes to everything. There is a message of more seasoned designers saying, oh, in the beginning, I said yes to everything. And I think what you just described is it's never just black and white. It, there's always a decision process through it. Do you agree? Am I taking your I, thing at, at what, it meant, what you meant? Yeah, I totally agree. And even like here in Austin, the market's crazy, you know, everybody, especially from a construction or renovation standpoint, and I have a hard time getting labor to come out to do small projects. And I just think these poor people, like they want a new bathroom and I can't get anybody to come out to work on it. So I don't ever want to be that problem for someone else, you know, and I know that that's probably me just trying to be a people pleaser, but it's like, they deserve to have this beautiful bathroom. Why can't I come help them with that? So, and they're great people. So I just, yeah, it's not black or white. It is, it, it, I don't think it ever will be for us. Mm. And, and just to say that though, I, I, I I would love for you to explain the difference because understanding you just said, okay, maybe I'm a people pleaser. I also don't think, like you said, if you want to, me to pick your paint colors and your floors, you're saying no. So you're not a 100% people pleaser. You're fa Maybe you <laughs> are, but you're factoring it in what supports your business. So tell us, like, what is it about the paint color and floor selection that doesn't fit the criteria for you? What goes through your mind business-wise on I'll, that? I'll, I'll tell you what it is. It's not even a business mindset. It's from um, past experience with clients and their um, happiness and their thought process about the quality of our work. And what I have found for things like these little, like, I don't know if ticky tack is the right word, but it's like, you're doing kind of tiny little bits here and there is that they don't visually understand the impact of it. When you're doing, even if it's just one room, but you're doing that whole room, they get it. They get why they hired you. They get the value add that you bring. Mm -hmm. When you are just picking up flooring or paint, they'll be like, thank you. That was a nice service, but I don't like, you know, I also could have like a monkey could have done that. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, 
uh, you know, I just wanted some validation. And, you know, that's one of the clients that we have started saying no to a lot, which we said a lot to in the beginning is those that sort of want our validation on their own opinions. Mm. I, I'm not going to do that anymore because then they start to design themselves and they just want us to essentially be order takers. And I don't, that to me is where the process is completely gone and the trust isn't there. And I don't want to be your validation person. I want to be the one to help you bring the vision to life and help create that vision. But I'm not going to say like, yeah, I think that that sofa would work. Go ahead and buy it, you know, and put me on retainer to, to ask you these questions. That's not the project I want. Um, and those I will almost 99 times out of 100 will say no to. Okay. You just, yeah, I love that. This is my line at Window Works too. We're not order takers, right? We, yeah. we want yeah. to craft and design a quality window treatment. So tell me about, if I said to you, you have to describe to your peers how to have a conversation. So I, you know, look, you're skilled in sales. This is all in this thing. It's that intake, it's le learning and listening to all the cues. But Sarah, tell us when you're having a conversation with a potential client, what are, can you think of some of the, the, the cues that you say, oh, this is going to be somebody who wants strictly my validation and to be an order taker. I've got to say no to this. <laughs> yeah, there's a few. Uh, you know, if they say that they have a hard time making decisions or um, they want to be really involved the entire step of the way um, or, you know, that they have they have they're, they love design and they have been doing it, but now they just don't want to even think about it anymore. They just want us to sort of take over. They're going to have stronger opinions about what it is that we do and, and we'll start to nitpick things. Um, we've had clients where they just say, well, I just didn't love that piece. Well, it's like, do you love every single shirt you own? Probably not. <laughs> like, you're not going to love every single piece that we show you. You're going to love some you know, and you're going to like others, but you don't have to be in love with every single piece. So, um, I don't always get it right. And for sure, we'll still take on some of those people, but it's more when they say, I just need help finishing this space out, or I've got, uh, you know, I've got all these ideas. I just want to show you what I've got. And then we can go from there. I had a, a potential client ask me the other day, if we could help her remodel a room in her house, she goes, I already have plans from another designer and we already know what, conceptually it's supposed to be we just don't know the fin like the specific finishes and I was like wow. Well, wow okay that's not I'm not designing at that point I'm your personal shop for to pick <laughs> out ways to bring that concept to, to life so you know there are, you you start to listen to enough people talk and you hear it I for me it's the client that really wants really trusts us and really wants us to execute our vision um and be more hands-off in that regard I love it. Great identifiers there. Do you, would you say that you could come up with some identifiers for when you're having that introductory call and you're thinking, yes, 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 all the right things. So there were great things to look for as red flags that are not good things. Do you know what they are for the right things? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, well, one, they have it, they have an understanding of the value of our service. So what you he listen for is, you know, when you're talking about budget, they have some sort of realistic understanding of that things cost stuff, you know, like it costs money to do nice things. Um, and they understand, you'll start to hear them say, um, you know, I just really need your ex expertise or, um, uh, I trust your work or I love your portfolio. And so here's what I'm thinking you guys really handle it. I, I had a potential client tell me the other day, like I'm at the point where I'm Jesus, take the wheel and you are Jesus. Take the wheel, please. I don't want to do this. Please take over and help me bring it all to life. Um, <clears throat> and I tell clients all the time, we are going to push you outside of your comfort zone. I'm not going to go crazy. We're not going to be like weird and wild, but I am going to push you outside your comfort zone. If you aren't okay with that, then you are not trusting of our process. And I have very frank conversations with them in the beginning and say, the, you know, we are going to be very involved, but also you have to trust us. And that's the biggest thing and keeping that line of communication open. Um, <clears throat> but it's usually, it's, it's when they're really willing to listen and hear you out and not be worried about where are you buying furniture from or, you know, I could do this, but I just don't have the time. Uh, if they could do it, then they would be doing it. So mm. that's, 
those are the things you sort of listen for is that do they trust you and, and the value you're bringing to it. Mm, I love it. I love it. It's so good. It's funny because I have a coaching client. If she hears this show, she will remember a comp- our very first coaching conversation. And she was telling me about a, a, a potential client that in the conversation, in the introduction conversation, she was recommended by an architect. So it was a solid recommendation. And it was, an, and it was a, you know, a, a quite an honor to be recommended by this architect. And she was very um, appreciative of it. But the client said these things, and this is the, our first conversation, you know, in our, our first session. She has several homes in all the, the 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 areas, right? List them off the highfalutin areas. She says, I have this home, this home, this home. I've decorated all of them myself. I've always done it myself. I really, really know exactly my taste. I can send you pictures of the things that I've created and I've done. Um, and I am doing this new 10,000 square foot home and it needs to be done. And I'm busy now. So I just need you to get all the things ordered and done. Mm. And, you know, we had to really pick apart her excitement at such an opportunity that is is, uh, imagining what the photographs would look, be look like at the end of this project, you know, a 10,000 square foot home with a budget, the way it was um, lining up to be. But I really was saying, she just wants you to be an order taker. She's not going to take your ideas. She's not going to take your input. She's everything you say to her. She's going to say, yeah, but I rather have this. I said, is this a relationship that you want to be in for 18 months? Right. And so that reminds me of that conversation. That's exactly it. It's like the the person who's like, I've dreamt of this moment of working with a designer. I don't know if they've like romanticized it or what. It's like they think, I don't know, they're in a movie. It's like, I've prepared all of these documents for you. And yes, and preparation's great. So you can tell us what you like and don't like, but then let us do our thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Like we're not like new best friends where I like, we're going to go shopping together and lunch together. Like that is not, I don't know. That's not the, the stance I take when I'm working with clients. It's a business transaction. It's not my new best friend. Right, right. I also love the other, uh, you know, little th- conversation that you have with your potential clients when you explain to them that we're going to push you out of your box a little. You're not going to go crazy down crazy path, but we're going to present to you basically things that you're, I, I'm hearing you, that you're saying, I'm going to present to you things that you might never have thought of, but I need you to trust that that has been presented as part of the package of that room, the, the intricacies, you know, one is going to ultimately connect to another. And at the end, you'll see why that lamp that you thought was off the wall is perfect or that chandelier, right? Is that what you're talking about there, Sarah? Exactly. That's exactly it. It's like you have to trust in the overall vision. And that's sort of part of the reason I don't like to install in phases as things come in. It's like, then they get this table and they're sitting there like, well, the table's okay. They're like, where's, you know, (laughs) how's it going to look with everything else? And then they start to nitpick things because they're sitting around their house um, looking at an incomplete project. And it is sort of that complete package. It's almost like a color in a painting. It's like trust that you need that color there. Like, I promise you, you're going to need it. It's going to just really give it that wow moment. It's not weird. It's like, you know, we had a client, it's like, can you, I, 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 they have a dining room. I said, I think we should wallpaper the ceiling. And they looked at me like I had four heads. And I was like, this is not even a weird idea. In my mind, that's not a weird idea. <laughs> but I looked at this room and I was like, this room has to have wallpaper on the ceiling. It just has to. This room is calling for that. And they, luckily they were like, okay, I, never, I would never have thought of that, but cool, let's do it sort of thing. So um, yeah, it's exactly that. It's, it's, you've got to trust the overall vision of it. Well, and I agree. And what I love about that is because to me, that's why you come to a professional. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and I think that's what you're saying. You're supporting the reasons and the cues that you are looking for when you're vetting a client and deciding if you take them, because if you present them with that idea and they're on board with it and then the first couple couple of times they prove to you that they're willing to trust you, they're going to get the best value at the end of that process, because mm-hmm. I look, I'm I'm a design I was going to say a design enthusiast. That's a stretch. Okay. So maybe I'm not really, (laughs) but having been in the industry all these years and having had the ability to see up close 
designers like Jenny Madden and Sandra Funk and Gail Davis and, you know, all, Beth Diana Smith. I'm just trying to think of all the ladies that we've worked with, Maureen Orsino. I mean, there's 40 of them, Charles Pavarini, right? Just amazing designers. And what I've learned is it is sometimes the craziest thing that if you showed it to me individually, I'd be like, you've got to be kidding me with that. But when you do go to that reveal and you see it, it's like, oh. And that is the secret sauce of a designer, as opposed to somebody who has just seen beautiful things, right? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there are times, too, where it, it's a whack, what, you know, quote unquote wacky idea. It's not even wacky to me, but it's like they're not going to be able to visualize this. And so occasionally we'll render up a room. I don't like to render too often because. Um, then they get hung up on, it should look exactly like this rendering, mm. but you know, I'll render up like a rough idea. Like, here's what I'm thinking. And that helps them visualize it a little mm. bit. Cause that has been the one thing is that clients are coming to us a lot of the time because they can't visualize how to put something together mm -hmm. at all. And so whenever you're presenting those one-off things or like wallpaper the ceiling. They're like, I can't visualize that. So uh, yeah, it is kind of going back to trusting the process and trusting our expertise. It's like, we're not just order takers. We're not just contractors getting the job done. It's like, we're bringing that value add. Right. And I love that the, you'll render up a room, but it's an idea of it. You don't go all the way down to the specific, because again, putting myself in the place of a consumer, if I get the idea, but I understand that this is not exactly this or that or the other thing, then I get where we're going, which gives me the comfort to trust mm -hmm. you. But I understand from the beginning that that particular chair you put in that rendering might not be the exact chair. I have to say, mm -hmm. Sarah Brennan did that when she designed my office here for me remotely. She hasn't been here yet. And one day I will finish doing her vision and we'll put pictures of it up and all the things. <laughs> I am like, okay, I need the desks. You know what I mean? But the thing was, yeah. she did the exact same thing. She did the intake with me, got my idea of what I wanted, description verbally of what I wanted, had the measurements sent to her, understood the functional needs that I had. In that first design presentation, she said to me, we were on Zoom, and she said, Lou, this is not any of the exact pieces. I'm, I'm like, listen to me on this, right? I think she had to talk to me a little bit more directly because, you know, I am not in the world and have not hired a designer before and all the things. And she just said, I want to just run by you three or four concepts that we have so that I can understand if we are on the right direction. And basically, you know, you know, because we are friends, she said to me, this is how I avoid myself and my firm spending hours designing for you to completion when I don't even know if you like the idea of using a crazy chandelier like this. Like, right. where's your comfort level? And I'll push you back if I really think that blah, blah, blah. But, and it was very helpful. And so, and, and as a consumer, once I understood She's not showing me the exact rug. She's not showing me the exact desk or any of those things. It was just like, do you look at this and like it? And I'm like, yeah, right. love it. And she's like, okay, next time I meet with you, I'm going to plug in to this, the exact pieces. And that was such a um, nice thing because I was able to say, okay, here's your check. Go do it. You know what I'm saying? I'm happy. Yeah. I'm comfortable. And do your magic. And whatever it is, it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Totally. And, um, in fact, I feel like photo realistic renderings are like the worst thing that's happened to our business. <laughs> Cause it's like people get hung up like, Oh my God, this, is this real? No, no, it's just a computer rendering. And it's like, but it, it's not going to look exactly like this. I need you to know it's not going to look exactly like right, this. Right. I'd right. rather go a little bit more conceptual. Right. I, I love it. And of course we have designers in the e-design tribe with Jenna Gadusik that they can, I'm sure you, if you don't have a render in house and you know, you don't want it to be exact, they can do, they can do it not exact, right? It's just right, your right. idea of how you as a principal would like to present it and how you have the conversation to set it up for your client. Right. Yep, exactly. And um, if you just have those, they may feel like hard conversations, but I think if you present it as fact, which it is, then they will buy into it. Mm, I love it. I love it. And before I let you go, Sarah, just outline your team for everybody so they have an idea of how you actually run your business with which team members and what their duties are. Yeah, so I'm 
um, I'm the founder and principal designer. So still every project sort of starts and stops with me. Um, and for the longest time I was doing all of our business development as well. And that recently shifted hands. Um, but it's myself, I've got two design teams that work under me. So they're each team is comprised of a designer slash project manager, and then a design assistant. And so when we take on new projects, I assign those projects to a specific team. And that's sort of the client's day-to-day -day touch point. And I check in um, from time to time. And I'm very heavily involved in the beginning um, conceptual phases. And then I also have an operations, a director of operations who looks at all those spreadsheets I don't want to look at mm. and handles all the payroll I don't want to handle. And um, and then we also have an office slash marketing admin, and she acts as uh, uh, she does all of our social media, our blog, um, she orders office supplies, and she also is sort of like my de facto assistant too. So if I can't, you know, run and grab lunch, she can go do that for me and those sorts of things. So, um, and we're about to hire, we're, we've just promoted one of our design assistants. So we're actually in the process of hiring a design assistant to fill her role and she's being promoted to junior designer. Love it. Love it. Tell me, how do you set it up when a client enters your firm? Because, well, let me take a step back. When a potential client reaches out, whether it's through the SEO or through a referral or whatever, whatever resource they come from, do you take that initial intake call and you putting your like, your little filter through like good client, bad client, let me, you know, offer to go to the next step. Is that your role still, Sarah? It used to be. And I, it used to be. And I always thought, well, it should always be me because my background is in sales. So I should do those things. And then there was one week in particular last year where I had had, um, I think it was like something like 12 prospective client calls. And mm. I sent out $200,000 worth of proposals. And and that was my whole week. And I didn't get to do any design whatsoever. And I thought, I can't do this anymore. And so I trained actually my uh, office marketing admin, I trained her to take those incoming calls. So now when somebody reaches out, um, I forward it on to her. I get the inquiries to my email still, um, and I'll kind of give a quick review. And then I forward them to her, and she has an initial phone call with them. And actually, we have found at least in the last year, that we can generate enough information off of a phone call and some photos and like just sort of like a little intel about the the home itself to be able to put together an estimate without going to the space. So usually what she'll do is um, have that initial call and then she'll connect with me once or twice a week where we run through all the people in the pipeline and kind of where they're at and what kind of projects are we talking about here. And, um, and she'll put together those, those estimates and send them over to clients. So um, I'm not as involved as it is that I used to be. And I now get involved in the contracting phase when they're ready to move forward with the contract. I'm the one drafting those and sending those off of those invoices. And then from there, um, it becomes, it, I sort of take the lead. I assign a team. We send them a client questionnaire. We onboard them. I meet with the design team and download them about the project. Um, and then we actually start going through our design discovery where we're learning about what they like and what they don't like and taking all the measurements and kind of what their overall goals are and really doing that deep dive into what the project's going to be. Um, and then we can start putting together those concepts and designs and um, drawing up plans and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then usually when we get to the, you know, actual selections and all of that, that's really when the design team steps in and takes the wheel um, and takes over. And I come in, you know, once a week, you can check in like, okay, where's this at and make sure everything's running smoothly. And, and unfortunately too, I'm still the person that is the escalation point if there's a problem mm. um, and trying to help deal with those things. But I feel like that's just kind of part of, part of my role and mm. always will be. You're right. Well, there is a, there's to some extent when things do get escalated, um, the client will sometimes only back down when they know the owner is the one they're talking to. They'll yeah, just keep they, pushing. It's like us when we are calling for a service on yeah. you know, cable. It's like, get me your manager. Stop can talking I to, to your me. manager yeah. mentality. Exactly. Like literally, it's like, I will literally just, please, can I just have your manager? Please, can I? Well, I would like this. No, actually, well, I love that. There's no manager in the building. Really? Right, That's right. amazing. Okay. So, but I have a question going back to that intake process. Yeah. So when the... 
So the lead comes in to your email, right? And and when you're going to see it first before you have your marketing office administrator make the call. But does that lead come in already with like lots of captured information? It's not just, hi, I'm Sally Smith. I want to know if I can hire you, right? I mean, is there something happening? Is Does the person to get to you have to fill out a form so that you've captured something of a criteria that you know it's worth having the conversation with? So it's funny. We have a conversation with everyone. There's no one that we say no. Like they give us an email and we say no. Um, But on our website, if you go to the contact page, it's a very generic like name, phone number, you know, fill in this information. But it also has a link at the very top of it that says, if you're contacting us about a project, don't fill out this form. Click this link and fill this out instead. And of course, people don't read. So half the time they don't do that step. But that step actually gives us a little bit more detail. Like, have they worked with a designer before? Mm. What's their ideal start time? What our date? Uh, what is their address? You know, because we can learn a lot just from Googling their address, you know, and kind of seeing the home. So um, so usually if they haven't filled out that form, we'll respond to their inquiry and say, thanks for reaching out. Could you fill out this form? And then we'll set up a time to chat with you about your project. Okay. And that's what we sort of have that deeper dive. Um, but you know, I got a lead yesterday, last night and they didn't fill out the form. They just emailed us directly. They didn't even fill out the basic contact form. And it said, here's a brief about our project and what we want. And they had put together a five page document about their, you know, interior design brief and which is a little bit of a red flag, but, uh, (laughs) but, but I was like, okay, this is enough information. Like you don't have to now also fill out that form that I was going to send to you as a follow-up, you know, like, it's just kind of like, I don't need to make it more work for you in the beginning. Right. Okay. I I agree. That's awesome. And I guess what it is, is it's just, there's some one way or another, there's some information before, see, I could see as the owner, Having every call, if it had to be cold, cold. But when you task it to somebody else, I feel like there does need to be some information gathered until that person is so skilled as you are as both salesperson, understanding the type of projects that you want to take and your criteria for taking them, which include all the things that you mentioned. And so... Um, you know, having that little intake with, you know, like I said, what is your projected start date? What is the scope of your project? Have you worked with a designer before? They're all good little cues that help you understand something before you get on the phone call, right? Right. And I will say too, and no detriment to my admin, but you know, she's brand new at doing those calls and she's 23 years old. Um, There are times we get leads and I can tell just from the email, it's a very good, very profitable lead. And I'll have that initial conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'll just go ahead and have those right off the bat. Like I normally would in the past. Right. Right. Well, cause uh, you're, you're teaching her. I mean, I, I have to say, amazing that you've put such um, confidence and empowerment in a 23 year old person to be the one that starts a conversation at your firm. That's, she must be a pretty special young lady. Oh my God. I like, she has become my right hand and Mm. I hope she never listens to this because she doesn't know (laughs) me, hear me glowing about her, but she is fantastic. And she just kicks ass in every regard. I mean, she just is just so good. And even at one point we had a company retreat and I said to the team, I go, I need someone to help me with prospective leads. And nobody spoke up. Nobody's like, I will help. <laughs> and, I, and I was waiting for her. Like I wanted her to volunteer. And then finally she goes, well, I guess I could do it. I was like, good. Cause I was going to pick you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I gave her a script and, you know, she got to sit in with, you know, several calls with me. And even now when I do those bigger leads that I'm talking about, she still sits in on the call and listens to the questions I'm asking. She's not a designer. She's not a designer by trade. She doesn't want to be a designer. She's a marketing person. That's her background. That's her skill. So she wants to, she doesn't know all the questions to ask about construction or, you know, those little nuances. So she listens in on those calls too. Okay. I love it. And I love that you do that step. That's so awesome to be able to have her sit there and have those moments of, oh, okay, because you can do the script all day long. But as soon as somebody says something different, it does put you it's like me with my podcast. I have the idea where I'm going to go. But if you say something really exciting, I'm, you know, we're ditching that idea. We're going right down that road in the moment. Right. right. So. Right. Yeah. And she does get stuck on questions from time to time. And luckily, she could just say, well, let me ask Sarah. Um, and I found it actually helps 
with our cachet a little bit too, because they aren't just getting the owner from day one, you know, they've got to kind of work towards that a little bit. They're not going to just get me on the phone whenever they want me. And I'm not trying to be all like precious about it, that I'm so special, but at the same time, you know, my time is valuable and they, they, they start to kind of understand that from the onset, like very early on. Oh, that's an amazing point that that's a, it's, it's funny because I was going to go to how do you guys explain and when does the conversation come that there's a design team and Sarah isn't going to be the person that has every single conversation with you about every single knob and do, do jiggy that you're going to approve. But it's interesting because you're describing in a way you're setting up from the beginning that Sarah has her things that she does. She's in her lane and whatever those are, how much they relate to your project, but you you don't have 100% access. That's sort of what you're describing. Totally. And I, and I definitely make that clear. And that's why I enable my designers um, who are the project managers on each project to really take the lead. They're the ones sending weekly email updates to all the clients. They're the ones who are calling the client to let them know that something came broken or, you know, that that a vendor's on their way or whatever it is. They're the ones having that day-to-day cadence with them. And then I show up for the install or I show up for the presentation. I mean, even yesterday we had a client presentation and I was like, do we really need all of us in this room? (laughs) And like, yeah, I should probably be here for it. But like, you guys have really run with this and I approved all the designs and was part of the initial concept. I don't need to be here for the selections. And I told the client, I go, you guys don't need me. And they're like, yeah, we basically, (laughs) he's like to my ears, you know, you just gave me back two hours of my day. Right, like, this right. is amazing. Yes. So, um, it, it is, it has been helpful. And I really want them to trust the team that they're with and that they're working with so that they don't need me every day, mm. you know? Love it. I love it. I love it. So good, Sarah. I knew when we first started working together, um, you know, hashtag smart lady. I just could see it, understand (laughs) the way that you spoke and you responded and the way you contributed all during the mastermind. Um, And everything you said today reinforces all of that. Um, In closing, is there anything that you can think of that you're saying, hey, Lou, you didn't ask me this, and this is something I really would love to share with my peers as far as a lesson, a secret sauce thing, something, a hard lesson learned, or a lesson you knew from your your past business experience to come to it. Anything come to mind? I would say it kind of goes back to the client psychology and know that, and you you probably know like as a human being and dealing with people in general throughout your life that sometimes people are mean or sometimes people are disrespectful or sometimes people don't get it. And I, I'd say my message would be, doesn't matter who you are. I don't care if you're the most successful designer in the world or you're just starting out, there are going to be people who do not treat you well. And that is part of it. And you kind of have to have a thick skin about it. If you are, if it's happening to you a lot, that's a bigger problem, right? That there's something going on there, but just know that there's going to be great people out there too. And that that one angry client shouldn't be discouraging to you. I remember we had our first, first time we had like a super angry client and I was so distraught and I, and you know, he was just, just really awful to us, really, really awful to us. And I remember talking to my husband thinking, this is awful. He's going to go write all these reviews and he's going to go tell everyone. And he, my husband said to me, he goes, this is going to happen. Mm. Like there are going to be people, people do this to you. That doesn't mean your business is going to go up in flames because this guy, even if he goes and writes a bad review, mm. he goes, this is going to happen. And I was like, you're right. It is going to happen. There's going to be people who are never going to be pleased no matter how hard I work for them. So if you can go with it with that mindset and not think that it's the end of the world, if there's somebody who's upset and just sort of take it in stride and know that there's probably other things going on that have nothing to do with you. Mm. I think that helps sort of take the emotion out of it. I love it. Great advice. Great advice because we can get in our own head sometimes and take it personally. And because like you said, you consider yourself a people pleaser. I've had dozens of designers refer to themselves in the same way. And when that happens, it's upsetting if somebody's not happy. It's not It's not just upsetting from the standpoint of the physical environment of being yelled at or disrespected, but it's upsetting when you do take it to heart and take it personally as a 
opposed to just externalizing it and say, this really whole reaction, you know, might not have anything to do with me. He might not have been raised well. His mama might not have raised him well, right? <laughs> like, yeah, you know, yeah. or it could be having a legitimately hard time in the personal life and you're just the person he's able to lash out at, right? Yeah. I also yeah, love and I it. would say most of the time it has nothing to do with us. Right. Most right. of the time there's something else going on there. Yes. And I, I also just want to um, emphasize what you said is that if it's happening more often than not, then there's something you have to look at in are you t- taking on the wrong type of projects? Are you not setting up your client expectations? You know, what's happening in your process? One client out of 10 or 20 is maybe they are having a hard day or a hard phase in their life. You know, Six clients out of 10 or 20, we've got a a message and a communication problem. Would you agree? I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, If there's a pattern, that's one thing. If it's, you know, one off here and there, that's just somebody who's miserable in some regard. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that, I mean, that, that's the reality of life, right? We're not all our best selves every day of the week, right? (laughs) No, I am. I I can't speak for you. (laughs) (laughs) Way to go, Sarah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. Well, I have to say, I just thank you so much. You just shared so many great ideas, concepts, tips today for the rest of us. And I appreciate your time today, Sarah. Thank you. It was so fun chatting with you, Luann. Well, you know, imagine, right? Some of us have done it. I've done it. You've probably done it too. Sitting down with your husband or your wife or your significant other and making that scary decision to quit your job and give your dream a year to work, right? And then for Sarah to do this and then come all this way, 120 projects under her belt and looking at hiring again under four years. This is pretty remarkable. And I just have to say, you know, we should all take a, take the time if you are lucky enough to have that person in your life that's supporting you, then you know, look around sometimes and just say, you know, hey. And so I, this is my shout out to the Vin Man and to Billy. Hey, <laughs> guys, thank you for believing in this, right? And so if you have those people in your life, because we know it's often the, the nudges from these people and also the confidence that these important people in our life give us that push us out of our comfort, comfort zone. And it reminds us that if someone else is believing us, even though it's hard right now, we got to keep going, right? And I feel like Kravit has been one of those champions for this podcast from the very beginning. You know, I've told you over and over, they didn't hesitate to be a show sponsor and they've stood next to me and next to you for over five years now. So thank you, Kravit, right? And I remind you here that the majority of Kravit product is in stock and ready to ship within days. Order your favorite prat- patterns from Kravit's exclusive in-stock collections like Barbara Barry's Midsummer to curated Kravit's exclusive de- decorative accessories. Keep your design projects on track, on time with Kravit and order your memos, set up your account, do all the things at Kravit.com. Alrighty, now back to Sarah. When Sarah started her design business, she didn't cross her fingers and hope it worked. Mm -mm. She had a plan. She had the big conversation with her husband. They figured out how to make the finances work and they agreed on the timeline. All right. And then she got to work. She decided to put some serious money into creating her online presence with search engine optimization. And while she ended up outsourcing that SEO, the second place where she focused on developing her online presence was through Instagram. And she managed this herself, all right? And she said she's happy with the results of both her investments of money and time because she knows that both contribute to keeping her pipeline full. And what do you think it was that made Sarah know to push hard into both SEO and Instagram? Well, it's no big rocket science, right? She said, she told us, I just said to myself, if I'm not here at established business with referrals, how are my potential clients going to find me? And so she knew she had to come out big and bold and make sure that she came up in those searches, right? Then the second thing that she faced was 
that, that trouble of filtering out the projects and the clients that weren't a good fit for her firm. We know this can be tough, especially in the beginning. Now, Sarah said she still enjoys taking smaller jobs for people that are a good fit, but she has her criteria. She doesn't take a client, big or small, that doesn't understand her value and the expertise that she brings to a project and a client that isn't ready to trust her to make something amazing that they'll both love. I want to recap what her experience has shown her are the red flags when having the intake discussion with the client. Using the word just. These clients, Sarah said, may not understand the work or expertise involved in creating a design project. You know, it's just picking out the accessories, right? It's just putting a few things together in a room. We've all heard that expression, right? Secondly, people that ask for piecemeal work. Sarah finds that if she's tasked only with bits and pieces of a larger project, that the end project won't be cohesive and the client won't really end up with what they want anyway, but they don't actually understand that the whole thing was kind of their fault at the beginning for not allowing the designer to take the realm, the helm, right? The third thing is being very sure of what they want and wanting you to do the sourcing and ordering for them. Okay. So this is what she's looking for. Somebody who is she's not looking for. She's, she doesn't want somebody that is like, I know exactly everything I want. I want you to just use your trade discounts to get it, right? Like that's an order taker. Somebody's looking for an order taker. So she, she identifies those people right away. Another is asking off the bat where the furniture is going to be sourced from. She's learned that this leads to red flags, all right? And then finally, mentioning that they can do the designs themselves, but they just don't have the time. Really, sweetie, can you though? (laughs) You guys know how hard it is. Come on, right? Now, everyone has their own comfort level with the client input and many of you are happy to take micro projects, right? Right? It's This is what's good for you. But in the end, it really doesn't matter if it's a $250 project or a $25 million project. You want to be sure that the client respects you, that you have a good feeling about them, and that you are very clear upfront about the expectations that you have, that they have, and how you will work in managing their project, right? I also love Sarah's advice for you if you're looking for help with your business, right? Getting it off the ground. Sarah suggests that you take business classes. If it's not in the budget to do that, start with YouTube, right? Tons of information. Listen to and read about business and entrepreneurship. Your your sources don't have to be design specific. And often you're much better if you are learning about business from all different avenues, right? How about she said, take psychology classes. Understanding human behavior can help you a lot as you engage with both your clients and your staff. And she said, don't let mean clients discourage you. Expect that this may happen and expect You know, that, you know, this is one of the things that come up a lot with my chairman of the board clients. Like they said this, they said that, what do you think it means? And a lot of times you just have to take the emotion out of it and parse it down to what the words are. And sometimes people are being mean and you got to set them straight. And most of the time though, they're just not thinking. So the idea is that Sarah's core bit of advice here was to take the emotion out of it, right? Now, if you're interested in what SEO company Sarah uses, it's called Client Expander. Although she's not sure if they're taking new clients. So if you're interested in outsourcing your CEO, you could try Googling SEO for interior design firms, or you could ask your webmaster, right? Lastly, I just want to say, you know, the third book is out, A Well-Designed Business, The Power Talk Friday, Experts, Volume 2. It is a terrific resource for you to learn some serious business principles. My nine co-authors cover everything from bookkeeping to contracts to productivity to skills scaling your business. So please go get the book on Amazon, or you can go to luannigara.com forward slash book two. Okay. So I have to say, thank you ton, Sarah, amazing rock star business lady. Can't imagine where your firm is going to be in 10 years from now. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I hope you got some good inspiration and tips from Sarah, and I hope that you will decide to be excellent. 
Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.